Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy, but we're in this together and we have some great people helping us along the way. Now, life gets crazy and parenting can be stressful. Many parents anticipate the stress of the mornings, of the afternoons, of the evenings. They experience stress throughout the day, whether it is the morning time and getting the kids off to school or after school time when homework must be completed, shuttling multiple kids to practices and activities, getting a healthy dinner on the table while dealing with sibling arguments or dealing with bedtime shenanigans, and let's not forget friendship issues, electronics battles, getting your kids to clean up after themselves, or life issues like divorce or illness, bullying, work stress, and whatever else is your personal bugaboo. Yes, life can be stressful. Parenting can be stressful. And we focus so much on how we can help our kids on how to talk to kids about anything. And today, I'd like to focus on us. What about the parents, the teachers, the coaches, those who are working with kids every day? How do we cope with our stress? And what might help us to take a collective breath, allow some of our frustrations to fall away, and become more mindful so that we can better help ourselves as well as those we love? Today, we have such a treat to bring back for the third time one of our favorite guests, Dr. Laura Markham. Dr. Laura Markham trained as a clinical psychologist, earning her PhD from Columbia University. She's the mother of two, now ages 21 and 25. Dr. Laura is the author of the book, Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids, How to Stop Yelling and Start Connecting, and Peaceful Parent, Happy Siblings, How to Stop the Fighting and Raise Friends for Life. We interviewed her on both of these books, as well as her wonderful workbook called The Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids Workbook, a great resource for parents. You can find her online at www.ahaparenting.com. Welcome, Dr. Laura Markham, once again to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Thank you, Robin. I always love our discussions. I do, too. I just am so thrilled you're here. And before we get into the bulk of the interview, I'd love for you to tell us, since we're going to be talking about mindfulness, first what mindfulness is and then how it plays a role in your life personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, mindfulness is just becoming aware of your experience. So it's, it's really just bringing yourself fully present and noticing your experience without leaping into action. Mm. So we resist uh, making a decision, jumping up and doing something. All of those things are ways to sort of run from whatever we're noticing in our feelings, right? But simply bringing compassionate attention. And you'll notice I added the word compassionate because when we notice what we're feeling, it can sometimes be overwhelming. But as we shift into allowing the extra dimension of our compassionate attention, then we're, we're activating our observer mode. So we're not getting hijacked into reactivity. Observer mode is a part of our mind, our brain's capacity that gives us a choice about how to react to whatever we're feeling. Mm, It's so important. And um, I mean, I just feel exactly what you're saying and and know that I'm right in that mode so much of the time. How does the mindfulness aspect that you've been concentrating on lately play a role in your life personally? How do you use it? Oh, I think that my meditation practice in specific 
has allowed me to become, to develop into the person I am today more than anything else. You know, I was in therapy when I was younger. I have read about a million books on psychology and self-help. I, I read lots of studies. I think mindfulness has been the most important thing that I've ever done for me as a human being, for me as a mother, for me in my relationship with my husband. I, I just think that it has allowed me, and the research supports all this and we can get into that, but it's allowed me to become a calmer person. I'm not a Zen-like person by nature. Um, I didn't have an easy childhood. It allowed me to heal in a new way, in a different way than psychology had allowed me to heal, in a deeper way. And it also, I think, opened for me a spiritual dimension in my life that has nothing to do with religion but everything to do with finding life rich and meaningful. Mm. And so I could specifically say I use mindfulness every day. Not only do I meditate because my kids are old enough now that I don't have to uh, worry about the time. I can meditate every day. But also I use mindfulness practices to shift my mood. And we can talk about what Mm -hmm. some of those are. Mm -hmm. And I use mindfulness practices to bring myself more present if I notice my mind is racing. So so to manage my mind, I guess mm-hmm. I would say. Mm. I, I think that, I mean, certainly myself, but I'm sure that many people are listening right now are, are thinking to themselves, yes, I need this right now. And, and even just hearing your voice, your voice is so calming. I, it's hard not to think of you as, as one of those Zen-like people. So <laughs> many mm-hmm. of us, you know, run around in a stressful state. Um, mm-hmm. We're often hopping around from one thing to the next. We're, we're trying to cram a week's worth of activities into a day to practice mindfulness Would you say we needed a lot of time? Do we need to be like a calm person who can sit (laughs) still? And, uh, you know, most people imagine that this it's like this person just, you know, with their hands out and their, you know, Mm. legs folded and they're just so ah, they're so relaxed and, and plugged in. So what really is needed and what is not needed in order to practice mindfulness and meditation? I think there's a whole continuum of what you can do and how much time you put in. I mean, you know, sure, if you want to go and be a monk on a mountaintop, (laughs) you can do that, but you can't raise your kids at the same time, right? Right. So we have to dial that back. We have to find other ways to make mindfulness practices work for us. And I think anyone can do that. Anyone can find small ways to become more mindful in their life, even in a very busy life, there are moments where we can do that and and tap into that. So, yeah. you know, no one can stay calm all the time. That's I don't think staying calm all the time is even the the goal. There, there's a famous um, the founder of Aikido, famous martial artist, mm-hmm. at, was asked, "How do you stay centered all the time?" And he said, I don't. I just recover faster. Mm, I, it's such an important statement. And it takes the pressure off because, mm-hmm. you know, we, I think we already put too much pressure on ourselves, parents, teachers, coaches, that we need to be this, you know, example of, of perfection, of patience when it's just not possible. And putting those types of parameters on ourselves actually seems to take away our ability to be mindful so I would, I'm going to challenge you to tell us mm-hmm. then, let's say we have 15 minutes mm-hmm. or, or we have five or we're sitting in the carpool lane waiting for our kids to get out of school or, you know, their kids are running around on a field or a training floor practicing practice a sport and we're, you know, sitting on the sidelines. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what kind of mindfulness practices can you recommend for the busy parents, the craze teachers, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. the coaches who get a moment, like what's, what can we do in a short amount of time? Yeah. So there are, I would say three things that anyone can do in 15 minutes that can change your life. Mm, that research gosh, shows will change your life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the first one is breathing, breathing 
changes the body chemistry. It deactivates the sort of fight, flight, or freeze response that's so often activated in our modern lives because we're just, we have this low level of um, anxiety or almost, mm-hmm. you know, uh, anxious. It's pinched and anxious and, you know, almost a little bit of panic. Well, we get there on time. We have to mobilize all the time. <laughs> Breathing changes that. It shifts us out of the sympathetic nervous system's uh, anxiety and into the parasympathetic and in the parents of the, when the parasympathetic is activated, it re, it's restorative. It's replenishing mm-hmm. to the body. It gets rid of the stress response that's so automatic. It uh, makes everything work better. Your immune system, your digestion, your cognition. You actually mm-hmm. think better. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't gain weight so quickly. I mean, it's just amazing when the sympathetic is activated, everything is geared toward an emergency. And we live that way. But when you breathe, when you bring your attention to your breathing, it shifts us into a healthier state, a calmer state. So many people say to me, when my kids are upset and I get upset, taking a deep breath doesn't help me. Well, okay, I get it. If you're in a state of emergency at that moment, taking one deep breath may not feel like it does anything. But if you're sitting on the sidelines Mm -hmm. at your kid's practice or you're in the car waiting for your kid to come out of the school You can take a minute, shut your eyes, and just breathe. And it can be very simple. Just just breathe in, breathe out. Just notice. And I I actually do something I call connecting my breath, which I learned from Michael Brown, who's a meditation teacher. And I, I don't know why it makes a difference. I think connecting your breath is more active than just noticing your breath, which is more passive. So it keeps you more focused and attentive. So your brain doesn't, your mind doesn't wander quite as much. But I guarantee you, anyone listening to this, you try this, your mind will wander when you've done about three or four breaths. It will. And so that's a great opportunity to practice self-love, to bring yourself back and say, that's okay. I'm just going to go back into, you know, noticing my breath, connecting my breath, breathe in breathe out. And just doing that, research shows, will shift you in the ways that I just described. So that's one all-purpose, terrific, easy practice. And it just brings you more present. Michael Brown, who I just mentioned, says that it creates uh, present moment awareness. Mm -hmm. You're accumulating present moment awareness as you do it. So that even later when your child gets into the car, you carry that calm with you. Is connecting your breath being con- just sort of consciously breathing? Or are you are you connecting the the in to the out? What does that word well, I mean? I think it's really just conscious. I mean, I'm going to speak for myself, not Michael Brown, because right. I don't know how he would answer this question. But I'll say that, and I've done this off and on for years, I would say that it is simply, um, when we just notice our breath and we just sit with it, it's enough of a passive feeling that, our mind gets hijacked more quickly mm-hmm. by our thoughts. Mm-hmm. Whereas if we're connecting, it's like we're we're noticing when it ends, mm. the out breath. So we can take another in breath. Mm. And we're noticing then, usually the in breath pretty easily moves to out. But sometimes if you just notice, what happens is when we breathe in, we don't necessarily, you know, we breathe out, but then we don't notice, we don't breathe in right away again. We just sort of... yeah. Right? Mm. We get, and we don't breathe deeply either. So connecting the breath is a less passive way of being fully present with the breath. And one of the things it does is it keeps us, um, it, it's like throwing the mind, it's like a, a guard dog that barks and growls and whines all the time. You throw the dog a bone, it has that bone to chew on, and it's not making all that extraneous, distracting noise. Mm. That's mm. what you're doing with your mind here when you do this. It does deepen your breath, which is which is actually good for you. But it also, while your mind is busy with the breath, you're able to tap into a whole nother part of your brain, mm. which is, it's it's a deeper level of restfulness But also a deeper level of, you could, some people call it source. You could think of it as a deeper level of healing. There's no actual thought per se 
you will have thoughts come to you. You can just let them go and think, oh, I can, I'll remember that later. It's fine, you know, or leave a piece of paper and a pen next to you in the car, or, you know, just jot something down and then go right back to noticing your breath. Mm. But research shows it absolutely transforms the body chemistry and it creates feelings of well-being and safety so that you can then stay calmer mm. as you go through your day. Mm, mm, okay, so br- so taking these deep breaths then is one of the key ways that we can use mindfulness in a short amount of time. And yes, and so yes. you just mentioned there's two other ones that you can yes mention. that I'd like to give you. And I do want to clarify something. Um, a mindfulness teacher at this point would say, "Well, yes, that absolutely is all true what she just said, but mindfulness is just becoming aware of it, not." making things different. Mm. So there is always that, I mean, we need to just be aware that there's always the the noticing where we are and accepting that fully, right? And then there's the making room for something different to happen. Mm. So breathing is a very simple thing that it it does sit with what is happening at the moment. It's you're fully present, you're you're accumulating present moment awareness, but you're also in a way, making room for something to happen because you're basically giving your mind a little mini vacation, Mm. right? So, so mindfulness, you know, you could, people have spent their years, their, their entire lives that, you know, years studying and articulating mindfulness. So I just want to say, this is a form of mindfulness, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I want to now tell you about one that is about changing nothing. It's just about, it is the most raw, basic, foundational kind of mindfulness you can do. It's, sitting with what is and what is is in the body because the body is where we experience like if you have an emotion how do you know you're feeling an emotion well because you have a sensation Mm -hmm. in your body and you associate that with an emotion like butterflies in the stomach oh I'm a little nervous Mm -hmm. about this upcoming meeting where I have to present right so you're you're basically learning as you do this to um yeah you're as you notice what's going on in your body, you're you're allowing it to be fully present and you're not trying to change it at all. So this is typically called a body scan. And a body scan is simply, so let's say you're there at the game or let's say you're in your car or in your house and you want to do a body scan. It can be as short as two minutes. It can be as long as an hour, but 15 minutes is a perfect amount of time to do it and what you do is you simply shut your eyes breathe a few times just bring yourself as fully present as you can and then I would in the beginning when you're first starting this I would start with a certain part of your body and move through your body Mm -hmm. once you get practiced at it you could just notice what comes up oh hmm I feel a little tightness in my throat Hmm, I wonder if I'm getting sick or mm. if I haven't spoken my truth to somebody, mm. you know, that could mm-hmm. be that, right? But but in the beginning, I would simply notice, like, bring your attention into your toes. Just notice your toes. You could wiggle your toes if they feel a little numbed out. Often we notice as we do this that parts of our body feel sort of blank, numbed out mm. because we haven't attended to them. But you you notice your toes, just sort of bring your attention to them the left toes, the right toes. You can do one foot and then the other. You can do them at the same time. But just notice them. Really just sit with them for a minute. Some people breathe into them. That just allows you to more consciously attend to them. But just notice. And then when you feel ready, move into the ball of your foot. Now, you can go as fast as you need to or as slow as you'd like to. And as you move through your foot, you know, you'll notice, oh, the ball of my foot feels a little sore. Yeah, I wore those heels all day yesterday when I was involved in that, you know, meeting. Mm -hmm. And wow, I'm really feeling it today. Oh, so it can just be a simply physical thing. But as you go through your body, often you'll notice there's a tightness in your belly. And before you know it, all of a sudden, you're, you're replaying in your mind that phone call with your mother that really upset you Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. with your boss or the interaction with your child when they were screaming at each other, your children. So things will come up. You're not trying to solve them at that moment. You breathe deeply into that and you just stay. Don't go into the storyline if it comes up. Just Mm -hmm. stay with the sensation in your body because what happens when you're in that moment 
on the phone or with your children and you can't really process it in that moment, it gets stuffed, basically. We stuff those emotions that we can't process at the time. And where do we stuff them? I always say the emotional backpack, but really it's the body. Mm. So that feeling in your belly is telling you about the emotion you stuffed. And yes, you could go in and think about the story of what happened, but that would just get you into your mind. Stay, Stay with the body. Stay with the sensation in your belly at that moment. Sometimes it gets very intense, but and you might even feel like, oh my goodness, I'm going to throw up. You won't, almost <laughs> never, right? But you'll notice the sensation, and as you bring your attention to it, what will happen is it will change. It always changes. You know, the meditation teachers quote the Buddha, you know, every, every sensation is arising and passing away. As we attend to it, it passes away more quickly because we're not hanging on to it in our mm-hmm. belly because we didn't process it yet. Suddenly when you attend to it, you're you're processing it it begins to dissipate and then it it's gone and then you're able later to think about that phone call or that interaction with your children in a less tangled up way you're not as triggered about it you're actually more clear because you've cleared that feeling out of your body out of the emotional backpack but when we don't do this we carry those feelings with us throughout our day and it makes us more anxious because we all have all these feelings sort of hammering at the door to get heard. So body scans, just being present with what is, not trying to change anything, change everything. Mm. Oh my goodness. Uh, you should have like a, I think you need to tape like a mindfulness, uh, some kind of like mindfulness for us to download. I could just listen to your voice all day. It makes, I find it so calming. <laughs> like love Thank that you. you're going, taking us through Thank this. You. Okay, so so we've got the breathing and we've got the body scan, which actually I do. I I have a I do that mind space. What is it? Mind space that thing that that uh, app every day um, that allows me to do uh, you know some of this kind of stuff. Uh, Wonderful because, uh, headspace. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's um, because you know coming to, coming to it on my own i need a, i feel like i need a little assistance so headspace mm-hmm. just allows you know me to do it in a i think it's either 10 minutes or 15 and mm-hmm. i can do and they take me through the body scan and that kind of thing so anybody who's listening if you feel like you need something you can absolutely use a tool um or you can do it for yourself yes. just like dr laura was just mentioning so you know there's there's things out there to sort of assist because uh, I also, I admit, I'm not like the Zen-like person. I, you know, definitely am, you know, the the type A, like my mind is racing a lot of the time from the moment that I get up. So I do it as soon as I get up and allow yes. somebody to be talking in my ear a little bit because I, I feel like I need a little assistance. I would love your voice in my ear to do that. So, um, so then there's... So, you know, there's I sister. have a body scan that's yeah. a free... 20 minute Ooh. meditation on my website. Oh, if you just good. go to the aha parenting, AHA parenting.com website and put body scan in the search Ooh, this is uh, good. box, you will find a 20 minute body scan that you can download and listen to. Oh, this is so good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could totally listen to that. Mm-hmm. I will be doing mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we've got body scan and breathing. What's our third one? Well, this is a really, um, happy one. I love this. Sometimes body scans, I mean, I think they're always restorative, but sometimes, you know, you, you're, you have to be a little uncomfortable as you go through, you know, those sensations, right? Right. Uh, And they take attention. Although, as you say, if you have a voice leading you through, it's a lot easier and that's a great way to begin. So you get this habit without having to worry about attending and having your mind you know, go off on other things. Yeah, I, I think I only I started that. like three months yeah. ago. So yeah. for me, I mm-hmm. definitely needed, you know, somebody yes. to be helping yes. me through. And my mind does still wander. So I'm so yes. in the beginnings of things. Yeah. yeah. But the third one is something called, which I would call, um, I could borrow Rick Hansen's uh, wording on it, savor the good. I think of it, I've, I've done this again for years and I've thought of it as simply experiencing positive emotions, choosing, choose love, choose gratitude, Mm -hmm. choose to experience a positive emotion. But Rick Hansen has done a lot of work on this. He's a very well-known, again, meditation mindfulness teacher. Uh, He actually wrote a book called Buddha's Brain about how meditation changes the brain. But, and he calls it savor the good. But basically, you know, that the new age folks would call it inducing a higher vibrational state 
But basically what we're doing is we're saying when you feel gratitude, when you feel love, when you feel empathy, and Rick Hansen added to my list pleasure, when you feel pleasure, you are, by inducing those feelings, you're actually um, changing the hormones and neurotransmitters in your body Mm -hmm. so that you're giving yourself, self again, a sense of well-being, a sense of safety. You're it's a counterpoint, um, really an antidote to the to the normal habits of the mind, because our human minds are always looking to protect us and keep us alive. And they happiness is not in their job description, right? <laughs> they have a bias toward negativity. They're always looking for what could go wrong, mm-hmm. what's bad, what we have to protect against. And so we automatically veer. Now, many of us also grew up with parents who tried to make us good people by mm-hmm. constantly criticizing us, mm. um, right? So the the voice, our parents' voice becomes our inner voice yes. unless we've done a lot of work to change that. So that could be an automatic criticism, an automatic negative perspective on the world. There may also be some people who are born with a more glass half empty kind of an approach, right? It turns out the the work that has been done on optimism shows that some people are just, it's definitely partly childhood and it's definitely partly something we can change as adults. But some of us just are born a little more glass half empty and glass half full than others. So the point is that since that's the way our minds might tend and that creates um, unhappiness, uh, negativity when we react to other people, a lack of emotional generosity, a lack of patience, a mm-hmm. lack of well-being. And in fact, it creates physical stress that is bad for our bodies. Mm-hmm. So we can counteract that with an antidote, which is to induce a more positive emotion, right? So the more positive emotion would be simply to notice the good things, savor the good things. And the best way, the easiest way to do this is to make it part of your routine, sort of to retrain yourself. So when you have your coffee or tea in the morning, take a moment to close your eyes and drink in. I mean, I would first start with always allowing yourself to be where you are. So close your eyes and take in where you are. Yeah, I'm dragging my feet into this day. I'm not sure I really want to go. I'm not really looking forward to the day. I, I didn't get quite enough sleep. We might we might start there. That's fine. But then to say, and I'm going to widen the lens here. I'm going to draw back the camera to allow all the good things that are there with me to come into the picture. I am so lucky. And it could be starting small. I'm so lucky to have this delicious tea or coffee and that mm-hmm. I have this to help me wake up and feel good. I'm so lucky that my children aren't waking up at night as much as they used to. I'm so grateful to have enough to eat this morning. Mm-hmm. I'm so grateful that I have healthy children, you know, that it's, it was just a minor, you know, earache that woke the baby up in the night and that, yes, we've got a good pediatrician we love to go to. So notice some of this is silver lining, but that's yes. act two. That is the counterpoint. So the simply looking for the good and then not just in our minds, but actually savoring it. Savor that feeling when you take your sip of tea. Savor that when you hug your child and the feeling of that delicious little body and that smell of their hair and, you know, just savoring the good moments. If the, the more we do this, the more often, the longer we do it for, the more it changes the brain and it is protective. It builds resilience. Mm. I, I'm taking in all the words that you're saying. I'm taking them in personally and uh, professionally. I, I think it's so important. I'm just imagining not just doing that myself, but what if what if we did that with our family? And I'm just thinking, you know, you had a board up in your house and put up, you know, Whatever is good, you know, whatever is good that day, recess, um, you know, my child sometimes gets really frustrated with school, but what was good today, usually he says recess. So, you know, (laughs) recess and um, that, you know, yes, you completed something today or a friend said something kind or I don't know, whatever, you had a good lunch 
And it's it's being able to visually see it or at least say it and and mm-hmm. really savoring that with your family. Um, you could do it in schools. You could do it in in mm-hmm. any any area where you're shifting your attention to what went well, you know, what, what's good today and, and how you can then do it for yourself. Absolutely. But it, it really seems like it's something that you can do with your whole family. Well, there's a lot of research on gratitude in specific. So I don't know of research that's been done with savoring the good for Mm -hmm. children, but works the same way for them, their biochemistry as it does for us, obviously. But the gratitude research for children is really striking. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeffrey Froh has done a lot of gratitude research with kids where, and and tweens and even teens, but I think he focuses a lot on tweens, but it works for younger children also. And basically, when we have the experience of gratitude, we know for adults, and it's true for children, they are happier that day. Mm -hmm. And even if you did it for just a week, or even a day, and then three months later you come back, that child is happier. Mm. Three months later, Mm. unbelievable, Mm. right? So yes, what you're saying, when families have a gratitude book Mm -hmm. or a gratitude jar, Mm -hmm. and the reason I like the book in the jar or your idea of the blackboard Mm -hmm. is that it's not just at that moment, but you get double mileage. You get to come back later and notice it. So you can write down that morning as you notice it or after school when your child says recess and then at dinner or before you Mm -hmm. go up to bed you can say hey before we we erase so we have a clean slate to welcome in all the good things tomorrow Mm -hmm. look at what happened today that was so great Mm -hmm. and the kids can shout out new things even as you're savoring the things that are up there right and we know it makes a difference in how cooperative they are as they go up to bed how Mm. happy they are how emotionally generous they are to their sibling even oh boy yes this is happening this Mm -hmm. is definitely happening i really love this whole idea and i think it's incredibly doable in a variety of different ways so Mm -hmm. thank you for that now (laughs) dr laura there are moments when we have 15 minutes or five minutes or two minutes and we're alone and we can take time to be mindful but you mentioned something before about the person who is like right in the throes of the the issue. Okay, so let's be frank. There are some moments when we could really use some mindfulness, <laughs> but mm-hmm. we're not alone. And frustration mm-hmm. is mounting. Your kid is pushing back about doing homework again. Your kids are fighting once again right before they need to leave for the bus for school. It's time for breakfast, but your child is standing on his head in the family room um, and you are about to lose it. So are there mindfulness practices that work in the moment when you feel yourself losing it with your kids? Yes, definitely. And remember, the more you do the other things we've already talked about, the better it will work in the moment. Mm. But even if you've never done any of that, and today one of the things you've just described happens you can still use this and it still works. Mm, So the most basic tool is your pause button. Your pause button is what I call stop, drop, and breathe. So at that moment when this is happening, just stop, drop what you're doing, drop your agenda just for that moment. So stop what you're doing, drop your agenda just for that moment, close your mouth, Step a, step away from the fight, whatever that fight is. I mean, if your child is beating on your other child, right. obviously you're flying over there and you're between the two children. But I'm talking about the 99% of parenting yes. that is not actually an emergency. It just feels like it. Right. right? Oh, good point. So, yeah. So you step away from the fight and you take three deep breaths to calm yourself. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe out through your mouth. And... What that does is it stops you from getting hijacked Mm. and it lets you choose how to respond. Three deep breaths doesn't take long. You could take one if you feel a, I mean, you will feel a sense of urgency. That's what fight, flight, or fright is, right? Mm -hmm. You think it's an emergency and you have to immediately intervene from fight mode. And fight mode means the child looks like the enemy and it will not be a constructive intervention. There's no way it will end up making you or the child feel better and you'll just end up in a more drama that will delay getting out the door to the school bus Mm -hmm. or whatever so so just ignore that sense of urgency that's fight or flight talking take the three deep breaths 
And then here's the hardest thing, actually, choosing to calm down. Mm. Because you, when you're activated in fight, flight, or freeze, you're triggered. You're, you've got to, you know, you feel like you have to jump in with your sword flaring, you know, <laughs> flashing. And so you have to choose. And what I say is choose love. Just choose love. Take the deep breath. Don't lash out. Choose love. And you can use little tools to choose that, to choose something more positive. Like you could have a, a thought that you say to yourself, like, it's not an emergency, mm. right? Or he's acting like this. He's acting like a child because he is a child, right? <laughs> or, or I can handle this. I can, because what is fear? Fear is the idea that we can't handle something. So we're afraid of it. But actually, you can handle it. So anxiety is a form of fear, right? So if you're worried about what's going on and, you know, you don't know how you're going to make get the kid to the school bus on time, it's like, okay, I can handle this. You don't have to go into, you know, warrior mode. You can handle this. And at that point, you probably don't, given what you've described, have time to soothe your body. There are tricks to do that. You can shake out your hands. You can run your hands underwater. You can splash water on your face. Mm. You can do a tiny body scan where you just breathe in and notice your body and you you say, um, I breathe in calm, I breathe out calm. You know, those mm-hmm, are ways to calm mm-hmm. your body. But if you don't have time for that, that's fine. Leave it. You are choosing, you're choosing calm. I choose calm. I choose love, right? And you then you turn your attention to your child and you'll find your intervention is 100% better. So what happens every single time you do this Basically, this is mindfulness, right? You're choosing not to take action based on your upset. You're choosing to bring more awareness. And every time you're able to interrupt your own parental, getting hijacked into your Mm -hmm. own parental tantrum, basically, you're building new neural pathways. So every time you do it, it gets easier. Your prefrontal cortex gets stronger. That's the executive function. And the pathways that lead to the alarm system of the brain the limbic system is the emotional system the amygdala is really the alarm that goes off the it's the actual alarm you're learning um how to calm yourself with these tools but you're changing your brain and neural system so that you have stronger self-calming neural pathways and you get you develop what they call vagal tone the scientists Mm -hmm. because the vagal tone is based on the vagus nerve which calms us down. Mm -hmm. So someone with good vagal tone is someone who's more resilient, who's more quickly able to return themselves to a place of calm. Mm -hmm. So as you do this more and more, you can do it faster. You can do it just with intention. You take one breath and you're right there with your kid saying, whoa, 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 honey, I see you're upset. Tell your sister in words, you know, no hitting. So you're, you're able to, even as you move to intervene, you're able to calm yourself because Mm. you have a better brain, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we talked about some of this with Dr. Lynn Kenny, who concentrates Mm -hmm. on calming down uh, Mm -hmm. techniques with kids. And and she did talk about vagal tone and the vagus nerve and and all of that is such such important reminders. Also a very popular podcast episode for obvious reason. And I, I would... I would love to go into it just a little bit more because while all of this is extremely helpful to parents, I and I imagine, of course, there's some kind of transference that happens both organically and consciously with your kids regarding mindfulness when you're practicing it yourself. So what would be one of your recommendations on teaching kids how to calm themselves down using breathing or other techniques when you're using it yourself And now, Mm -hmm. you know, there's things we can do. What can we teach our kids? Well, I think what you've just said is so important because you mentioned that we're doing it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the role modeling, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. I want to back up and just give a little caveat that I get asked this question very often by parents. And what I usually say to them is, look, if you were really angry and you were trying to tell your partner this and your partner said to you you're very upset you need to calm down oh gosh take three deep worst. breaths together right <laughs> would, would you want to just smack oh it's like you the know, worst. it would make you want to take three deep breaths and calm down <laughs> so the you know when when we're upset we need to be heard 
We, rage only begins to dissipate once it feels heard. Yeah. So ch- when, when children are actually upset is not a good time to say, calm down now, take three deep breaths because yes. they will get worse. They will get more angry. The thing to do when they're actually upset is to say, oh my goodness, you're so upset about this. I didn't understand that this was so important to you. Tell me more, mm. right? Mm. But, but we can also help our kids learn these skills. And that's related to role modeling. Mm. That when we are using these tools, we model it and we also can invite our child to learn them with us. Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to teach them to our child to fix our child from being too emotional, right? We're learning the skills together as a family because they're so useful and we're practicing them and you're role modeling when you get upset, you know, in traffic, you know, you're going to be late somewhere. A driver cuts you off. You're driving the car. Your kids are watching and you say, wow, I could get really upset here, but I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to use an antidote. Even though I'm a little worried about being late, it will be fine if we're a few minutes late. It'll mm-hmm. be okay. That's an actual, gr- that we haven't talked about that technique, but it's a great way of acknowledging where you are and also shifting gears. The even though, and people use it when they tap. So tapping is a great thing to teach your kids. Tapping came from emotional freedom technique, EFT. There's a page on the AHA Parenting website that tells you how to do this. Mm -hmm. But it's very simple. You don't have to go into the, the detailed version that's there. You can simply take your hand, the side of your hand where your pinky is, like where you you'd hit a piece, a board if you were a karate master. Mm -hmm. Just tap with your other hand, your fingers of your other hand on that part of your hand. As you do it, breathe deeply. <sighs> and then say, even though, so you're acknowledging where you are, even, and, and you're not saying, even though I'm upset, even though I am angry, because that locks you into those feelings. You're saying something a little different. Even though I feel upset right now, mm-hmm. even though I'm, ang- I'm feeling angry right now, that's a much more malleable state, right? So even though I feel worried right now about getting to our doctor's appointment on time, I know I can choose to stay calm. Mm. That's, that's one right there you can model for your kids. Or mm. I know mm. that the doctor usually runs a little behind and will be fine. We just have to stay calm, mm. right? So you're mm. modeling for your kids how to do that. And then when your child is saying to you, I'm worried about my spelling test tomorrow. You can say, do you want to do the tapping like I do? Even though I'm a little worried about my spelling test. I know I've studied and whatever happens, it'll be okay. Mm. Right? I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm prepared and I'll do my best. Mm. It's okay not to be perfect. Mm. So kids can even then go into the spelling test and when they get a little anxious at a word they don't know, they can use that in the spelling test. Kids who can talk themselves through anxiety are the most high functioning through childhood and beyond. Mm. So this is a great tool to notice what we're feeling but have a healthy response to it. And this is something we can model for our children. And of course, you, you can model stop, drop and breathe. There's so many different things we can model. But rather than telling our children to calm down, we can say, hey, this is a great tool that I'm using. I love it. And our children will want to try it too. Love it. Love it. And of course, we can model it for them, but we could also show it to them when things are calm. Like, here's Mm -hmm. a tool that I've been using. Everything's fine right now. But if there was it, it was something going on. Here's something that we can do because then you're not dealing with the crisis in that moment. Um, So I think that's important too. So, and there's one, can I tell yes. you one more? Oh, yes, please. It's, it's, it's a game, but it is transformative. Uh, and I call it the three-minute blessing. And it's simply when I would have my kids on the subway, uh, because I live in New York City, but you can do it when you're driving. I love to do it when I'm out and about. Uh, and you say to your kids, hey, I have an idea. Let's beam love to the people we pass. Let's see if it makes a difference in how we feel, or maybe even how they interact with us. Hmm. And and you just, as you're walking down the street, as you're sitting in the subway, as you're sitting in your car, and someone pulls up to you at the traffic light, just beam love at them. You can do it as bless you. You can do it as I love you. You can just beam love. Here's what happens. 
you're as we feel, remember, feeling a higher vibrational state, feeling a feeling love changes your body chemistry, changes your sense of well-being. So as your children do this, I, I call it the three-minute blessing because I've noticed that within three minutes, you transform your emotional, mental, physical state. So during that three-minute game, as we beam love to people, your child is experiencing love. This, the research shows it makes them a more compassionate person. It gives them a sense of well-being. It makes them more, um, it makes them happier, right? So what an amazing trick to give your children to transform their well-being and it makes them more aware of other people because my experience with this is people who just look like ordinary people suddenly become quite beautiful when you're beaming love at them and it makes us more um it makes us include all of humanity in our emotional generosity which makes the world a better place and i will say that even though my daughter did say to me once Mom, I can't smile at people because they think I'm coming on to them. This is when she was a young teenager. Mm -hmm. I said, you're totally right. And I'm not suggesting you even smile externally. Just notice what happens if you feel this internally. Mm. And she says, even when you're not smiling, and I've experienced this too, it changes the look on your face. You don't even necessarily meet their eyes. But it changes the look on your face so that people smile at you more. They feel better more positively disposed to you because you're moving through the world with a with a a presence of more love. Mm. Mm. Well, you answered my question about if it's external or not, um, and if you're actually saying something or doing mm-hmm. something. So I like that. Um, I think that's extremely helpful. And and the ni- nice thing is, whatever technique works for you, do that. You know, I mean, yes. there's different yes. things work for different people, and I think sure. these are all different ways of of getting at it. I think that's beautiful. Now, we talked about what to do when we're about to lose it with the kids. And I'd like to just push it just one piece Mm -hmm. further. When a parent finds him or herself repeatedly on a daily basis, getting triggered all the time, where everything pushes him or her over the edge, almost as if the day before or weeks before or months before never really get washed away overnight. And so the starting point of frustration seems to be way past fresh as a daisy and patient as a saint when you wake up Mm -hmm. in the morning. So will mindfulness work for that parent, who's many of us, or does that person need something else? Okay, great question. So first of all, most people don't wake up in a good mood all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't wake up in a good mood every day. Mm -mm. I've just learned over the years how to pull back the camera to see more things that I'm grateful for, how to shift my inner state to a sense of well-being. And anyone can learn that, but but you're totally right that sometimes your your kid comes running, screaming into the room, mm-hmm. and one mom told me, and she pulls back the covers and sticks her feet in my face on purpose. <laughs> oh, you know, it's gosh. like, it's very hard to have a sense of well-being when yes. that's happening, right? <laughs> or when the baby was up all night or whatever. Right. So... So sometimes it feels like mindfulness is just too hard. Any of the things I've talked about are just too hard. And I would say we're really describing ongoing stressors in your life at that Mm -hmm. point. So in addition to sort of starting at a baseline and trying to help yourself be more present and notice what you're feeling and even be able to shift your state, we're really talking about removing some other stressors. So sleep Lack of sleep is a major stressor mm-hmm, for parents. Mm-hmm. Nobody can be patient. Patience of a saint, forget it. You know, like <laughs> no, patience right. of, of a, you know, anything. <laughs> you can't be patient when you're really tired. So, you know, working on sleep as a top priority, mm-hmm. I think it, whether it means that your baby is going to wake up, so you have to go to bed, you know, when the kids do, if that's what it takes, a number of the nights in the week, you know, when your kids are little, whatever it is, just solving the sleep problem. And I would say the other thing besides meditation that is always shown to be very effective in reducing stress is exercise. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I personally am not someone who loves to go exercise. I mm-hmm. never look forward to it. I'm always happy once I do it. <laughs> but exercise is critical to maintaining not just a healthy physical state, but also a healthy emotional state. So I would say finding ways, even if you're trading off with another parent. So, you know, if you can trade off 
you know, every afternoon after you pick up your kids from work, you're both, if you're both there, you know, at pickup time and you can give that parent your two kids on Mondays and you take her two kids also on Tuesdays and at least you're going to the gym on Monday, right. you know, that's yes. way more than you were. You yes. know, and maybe you can do it again Thursday because your partner can take the kids and maybe you'll go on Sundays or mm-hmm. Monday or Saturday, whatever. But finding a way to go two or three times a week, no matter what you have to do, I think is really, really helpful mm-hmm. um, at, to get rid of stressors. And then I would add, most of us are carrying around, as you said, things that aren't resolved from, from right. it could be from last, it could be from last month or last year, the divorce last year. Mm-hmm. It could be from... When he was raped when they were 21, it mm-hmm. could be from when they were, you know, when something happened when they were a child mm-hmm. or simply a generally negative thing when they were a child or just a hard, stressful childhood. And what happens when we have those things we're carrying around is that we need to actually empty our emotional backpacks and retrain our neural pathways because um, a sense of well-being has a harder time coming in when we're always feeling all that old garbage mm-hmm. bubbling up from the emotional backpack, we it's very hard to have a sense of well-being. So I would say, or, or and I would add, some of us also are, as I said, primed from birth to have a little, an alarm system that is a little more active than other people's alarm mm-hmm. systems. You can work with that. You can change that overactive alarm system, right? You can induce, um, you can actually shrink the size of your amygdala by giving it less work to do. Hmm. But for all of this, I suggest that you find ways to work with the stuff that you're carrying with you in your emotional backpack. And there are specific exercises, which if we had time, I could take you through some right now. I will say that my workbook, Peaceful Parent Happy Kids Workbook, the whole first half is for the parent. It's designed to help parents work through old issues so they don't get triggered as often mm. and be able to shift gears to create a sense of well-being for themselves. But if we have time, I'd be happy to yeah, take give us, through. Give us something. Give us something. Absolutely. Okay. Great. So here's an example of changing your neural pathway. So you may have heard uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. So if what's always happened to you when your children start having a meltdown, your child starts having a meltdown, is that you freak out, that could be very old, that could be an old trigger. It could be when you had a meltdown, when you were little, you got smacked across the face and it's an emergency when some, when a child has a meltdown for you in your own mind. Mm. So when your child has a meltdown, you just freak out and you can't stand it, mm-hmm. right? Or maybe it's when your children fight, which sets most of us off, mm-hmm. right? Whatever it is, notice the, the pattern and then train yourself to react differently. So I would do some work with this with with a journal and with just yourself sitting in a calm, compassionate state where you and you know, where you hold yourself with compassion and you sit down by yourself on the couch and do some breathing and then review in your mind the last time this happened, the meltdown or the kids fighting. Notice what happens in your body. You're gonna feel something in your body. Mm-hmm. Don't go into the whole storyline. Just notice, you know, the clenched stomach or the clenched throat or or how you're hyperventilating. Notice that and just sit with the sensations in your body. We have to be willing to feel discomfort to mm-hmm. deactivate our old triggers. But as you sit with the discomfort, it will begin to change. It the the feelings will begin to diminish. They change. Sometimes they to begin with when you attend, they intensify. But then they begin to diminish. They change. You might have noticed your belly to begin with, but now you're noticing your breathing is tight. And then as you sit and notice the breathing, the breathing sort of seems to normalize, but you notice, huh, what's that in my feet? It feels like I, I want to run away. Mm. Well, that would be a normal response, a fight, a flight response, right? And as you notice that feeling in your in your feet and you just notice it and you sit with it, that begins to diminish and then you start to feel better, right? So as you do this, you're actually deactivating that the sensations that you've been dragging around in your body, making you sick and tired, and you're deactivating. And then in the moment with your children, when this begins to happen, notice you'll still have the trigger. You'll have, and your automatic reaction is to, let's say, raise your voice and scream at them at that moment. Um, notice what's happening, notice it, but you'll have more ability to stop, drop, and breathe, Take a breath, resist your automatic reaction of yelling. 
So you've activated the pause button. You're resisting the automatic reaction. That's what's mindful here. Slow yourself down so you don't react. That breaks the habitual neural connection, Mm -hmm. which goes, kid has tantrum or children fight, and you start yelling. Mm -hmm. Now, you might even give yourself a little extra support. Put your hand over your mouth so you stop yourself from yelling. You're Mm. breaking habitual response. Mm. And then it's very hard to not do anything in that moment. But what's easier is to redirect your response. It's like with children. You can't really stop a toddler from throwing something they want to throw. But sometimes you can redirect it so they throw it somewhere safe or they throw something safe, right? So redirect your impulse toward a healthier response. Instead of screaming at your children, for instance, train yourself to take a deep breath and let it out slowly instead of yelling. Just breathe out through your mouth (sighs) slowly at that moment. Conscious breathing, as we said earlier, is proven to be a calming antidote to the anger response in your body. Because if you really had something like a robber or a tiger that you were in fight response against, you wouldn't take a calming breath, right? So you're giving your body a signal to calm down. So you're substituting a different response, a calming response. And that means you no longer jump. The more you do this, the more you practice it, you no longer jump right into yelling, first of all. But you also jump into a calming response at that moment. Over time, you're actually deactivating the old neural pathway that associate, that was wired together that is that had you associate your kids fighting and you yelling to your kids fighting as a signal for you to take a deep calming breath mm-hmm. and then reach for a thought like oh they need the skills to work this out mm-hmm. right and mm-hmm. i can coach them i can do this i can handle this yeah, very useful information, and I, I think that we can put that into play right away. I love the idea of just breaking the pattern because j- just doing something different, um, you know, and it may not be the answer. You know, for a moment you may need to walk out of the room, you may need to crouch mm-hmm. down and and hide for a moment just so you can get yes. yourself together. So you're doing something different. Uh, I, I remember when. You know, I I was younger and I really wanted to stop. I felt like I was yelling a lot. This is when I was a teenager and went to college. Like I felt like I wanted to change that about myself and, you know, being a reactive person. And the way that I started to do that was I started to kind of just get myself in in a in an alone state, you know, just I need a I need a break and I would walk into another room. And it would be like a half an hour or an hour. It took a long time. And and it got shorter and shorter over a period of time. Um, I just remember my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, was like, you know, can we talk about this? You know, whatever it was. And I I, I wasn't there yet. And then, you know, was able to get into a point where, you know, the duration of that break was was shorter. So just giving yourself something different to do and understanding that that different thing may change over time, get shorter, you know, be more of a a moment than a half an hour or an hour. And then of course, later on, more triggers, having children and that kind of thing, you know, have to, it looks like I'm going to need to go back into practice, I think, mm-hmm. based on everything we talked to today, talked about today. But I, I really appreciate just the idea of breaking the pattern because I think anybody can then do that. That small piece is something that's doable. And I'm betting when you did that, when you left for half an hour, you did two things. One, you were actually noticing the discomfort, whatever those mm-hmm. uncomfortable feelings were. So you were emptying out old garbage that was getting in your way so you could just, right, stay calmer in the moment. And two, so you you were actually rewiring in a sense, right? And two, you were practicing. You were practicing getting calmer. So as time went on, you didn't have so much garbage that you were carrying mm-hmm. with you. You were able to, to move more quickly. You were more resilient. And then you were also, it had you had the neural wiring to move yourself into calm faster. Mm -hmm. And anyone can do this. Yes, yes. And I I am telling you, like I was, you know, definitely much more reactive. I I feel like that stuff is coming up again, you know, the more pressure I'm under, you know, dealing with two kids are fighting and and that kind of thing. So I think it's, it is something that I've been more conscious of lately. And obviously, reason why I put in mindfulness into my 
practice of every morning and we're working it's a work in progress like hey like this is going to take a while so and that's okay by me I just I know that I need it and I'm, I'm so glad to have you on talking about it I'd love for you to tell us your top tip what is your top tip for parents so that we can integrate mindfulness into our lives and and make our family life better mm, I would say resist acting when you're angry mm. right mindfulness is all about being fully aware of what we're feeling, but not getting hijacked by it, bringing in the observer self. And if you can notice you're angry, I'm not saying stuff the anger, that would make you sick and tired and Mm -hmm. wouldn't be effective. It would explode out later anyway, because it wouldn't be under conscious control anymore. So notice that you're angry, but instead of acting on it, allow yourself to notice it And maybe take it a little deeper if you can then or later when you're not angry to just notice what happened and maybe what else is there. Because under our anger, there's something else. There's fear that our children, that our son won't ever stop picking on our daughter or fear that our daughter, maybe she has some kind of a learning disability or ADHD. She just can't focus. So there's often fear Mm -hmm. under there. Or sometimes there's grief. Mm -hmm. Our our child is 12 and he seems to be growing away from us. Mm -hmm. He doesn't seem that interested in connecting anymore. So fear and grief are often under the anger. Mm -hmm. But we would never know that if we act on the anger, we create more drama. And we don't actually get to the heart of what's causing the anger where we could actually maybe intervene in a constructive way. So I would say stop, drop, and breathe, obviously. But that's what allows us to resist acting on the anger. Mm-hmm. Oh, love it all. I just I just am so, so grateful for you and, and that you're here. And can you give us the resource of the week? Where can people go to get more information about you and your books and your workbook? My website is ahaparenting.com. It's a thousand pages of free information for parents of all age kids. Uh, There is information on mindfulness. There's a free body scan you can download. And you'll also find information on the website or just on Amazon or your local bookshop on Peaceful Parent Happy Kids Workbook, which Mm -hmm. talks about many of the things we've talked about today and many more. Yes, yes, I have it and love it. And it is a wonderful resource. I encourage people to absolutely get that workbook. And I want to thank you for coming today. I'm always appreciative of your insight and your strategies. I think you just have such a calming presence. I just, you know, feel like you're like a warm blanket on a cold day. And I just love what you said about the ability to for everybody to be able to do this that it's a a consciousness it's a breaking of patterns and that everything that we're doing can transfer to our kids in a positive way and there are very small ways little things that we can Mm -hmm. do right now Mm -hmm. that can make a difference yes yes every day that's right well, thank you, and I, I, I hope you'll come back again for a, a fourth uh, installation. I'd love that we're having a fresh 2019 with mindfulness um, in, our, in our sites with our families, but I am really grateful that you came on the show today. Thank you, Robin. It's always my pleasure. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends. I know you have yours. Let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. We'll go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash drrobin. I'm also on Instagram at drrobinsilverman and so is our guest, Laura Markham. I mean, she and I will be going back and forth on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, sharing memes and talking about this episode. I hope you'll join us. It's a lot of fun. And if you love this podcast like I did, I hope you'll go up to iTunes and rate and review it so other people can learn about these outstanding solutions that Dr. Laura Markham brought up today and use them in their own homes, their schools, their gyms. I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today. My fellow parents, leaders, and educators, thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. There's great podcasts up there, and the show notes to this podcast will be up there as well, quoting Dr. Laura Markham on all the wonderful things she talked about today. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, You've got this. You're here. You're getting the information you need. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. And as you are listening to this and thinking to yourself, but I did this, but I screamed at my kids, but I, I was overreactive, 
don't worry. You can do this. You can do this now. You can start today. It is never too late. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you are 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.